First Friday Forum. I am the chair of the Business Advocacy Committee, Mark Smith, and I will be uh, moderating as gently as I possibly can today our two guests from Madison, two of our elected officials. Before I introduce them, though, I'd like to introduce and thank our sponsor, Prevea. We have a round of applause for Prevea and sponsoring our organization today. I'd also like to say thanks to the All Club, our, our um, venue for today's First Friday Forum. Today, we're going to have two of our elected officials speaking with us. And they're in the audience. I'm going to give them just a minute to wrap up with their lunch. But they are Representative Katzma and Senator Lemihu. They're here from Madison. And we have a series of questions for them. And I'd also like to mention, as they're making their way to the to the stage, that this whole process, this First Friday Forum process, is brought to you by the Business Advocacy Committee of the Sheboygan County Chamber of Commerce. For those folks in the audience who are members of the Business Advocacy Committee, if you could raise your hand, please. And this is an opportunity for you to take note of those members who are bringing this program to you. If you have suggestions, comments, concerns, complaints about the programs, ideas that you would like to see implemented for future programs, please let us know. We'd love to hear your comments. So with that, I would like to introduce today Senator Devin Lenihu and Representative Terry Katzma. We have a series of questions for them, and they are going to have the microphone, and I'm going to probably, after this first question, just kind of speak as loudly as I can with the questions. The first question I'm going to ask you both, please, can you summarize what's been going on, what's been happening in Madison during your first few months in office, and what you've been working on? And maybe if you would, too, please refresh us on your committee assignments as well. Uh, first of all, I'd like to correct you. We are not coming from Madison. <laughs> we actually both live in Oostburg, um, two blocks apart. So Oostburg has great power in the state legislature right now. <laughs> We're here to represent our entire district. So I serve on... Uh, four major committees in Madison. I chair the uh, Elections and Local Government Committee. I also serve on Health and Human Services, uh, Agriculture, Small Business and Tourism, and the Administrative Rules Committee. Um, but what I've been working on in the last uh, this, uh, 2016 session, uh, there's there's been a lot of bills that I've been working on. I just actually had five bills signed into law on Monday and Tuesday this week, so I was excited about that. Um, and uh, two more, which the governor has not signed yet, which I'm looking forward to. But uh, a couple of the bills, um, be before I get into the bills, I want to clear up a perception. I was on a radio show on Monday, and a caller called in and said, how many bills has the governor signed into law this, this session? And I said, well, I think it's somewhere around 300, which I was a little high. It's actually closer to 200. We might end up close to 300 by the end. And um, he said, so over a decade, there's 3,000 new laws passed. Do we really want government passing that many laws? And, you know, that seems like a lot, but actually what we mostly do is changing current law to better uh, help businesses, uh, residents, uh, citizens in our district. We're not adding new laws. We're making it easier for, for people to work within, within the current legal system. Um, just a couple of the laws, which I just recently had the the ability to work on is um, <clears throat> one that was just signed into law. I worked with the county's association and our county planning director. In the budget, we have their shoreland zoning laws. And in the budget, there were some changes made to standardize it. And a lot of us felt that those changes went too far and took away local power. So I worked with the county's association, Aaron Brault, and, and the Manitowoc county planning director. And uh, we gave a little more power back um, to the local levels of government to make sure that when a new house is being built on a lake, that it respects the property rights of, of the, their neighbors so they don't build up a huge house and block the view of everybody else, you know, things like that. So it's just, it, it's changing current law, it's not, not adding law. Uh, some of the other bills that I've uh, recently gotten through, um, I had a business up in Manitowoc, which is in my district. My district goes up to the city of Manitowoc and then over to Hilbert. And uh, they do medical collections. It's a Maricolecto fast-growing business. 
and um, they had they're having a hard time finding new new employers to come come work in their business. And they had a few people who had disabilities, uh, some transportation issues, who wanted to work from home. And uh, under current law, you couldn't work from home. So what we did was just made a simple change to state law that allows them to have employees that work from their houses. They still have to comply with, you know, having their employees monitor the conversations record, all the same things that occur when they're working in the facility. But it gives that opportunity for you know, someone with a disability to be to be working from home and be a productive member of society, um, while protecting while also ensuring consumer protection. So those are those are some of the things that 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 we work on. A um, couple of bills I'm still trying to get through the through the system yet. Um, one of the major bills that I've been working on. And just well, just to let you know, I've passed 13 bills this session. I have 13 bills signed into law, with two more that are going to be signed soon. All, all 15 of those have bipartisan support, um, which I'm sort of proud of. But uh, a couple of bills that I'm working on right now might not have bipartisan support, but I think they're sort of good bills. Um, one is online registration. It, it allows people who are eligible to vote to register online. Um, it's a, it's a pretty extensive bill. And uh, it does a lot to make sure that our voter rolls are cleaned up. It, it, it um, signs us up into an interstate group that searches death records, um, obituaries, uh, when people move, uh, when they sign up with their deeds, just to root out duplicate records, fraudulent records. And when people register online <coughs> to vote, they need a valid ID. So that way, it takes away the human error of, of you know, handwriting some, some registrations and then typing them in. Uh, so it's a way of cleaning up the voter rolls while giving more, more access to people to register to vote online or eligible to vote. Um, and it also allows anyone who wants to go out and, and help people register to vote. Because if you have an iPad, a tablet, a smartphone, a secure, election, a secure connection to the state website, uh, you can you can help people to uh, get involved in the electoral process. Uh, we also made a, a couple of changes in there to make it easier for people who are in residential care facilities, such as nursing homes, to be able to vote and use their intake documents as, as proof of residency to make sure that, that the elderly have the opportunity to continue to vote if they've given up their driver's license and state ID card. And, um, and it also included veterans' IDs as an example of a voter ID. Uh, but the most important bill that I'm working on, and that bill actually has passed both houses at this point, um, but it's just in different formats, so we can take it up again in the Senate to concur with the, the changes that the Assembly made to my bill. I'm not sure why they're making changes to my bill. <laughs> uh, the other bill that I'm still working hard on, um, for those of you who follow federal politics, uh, they've been working on a RAINS Act, which, which puts limits on what the rulemaking ability of bureaucracy gives more legislative oversight. And we have a state version of that that I've been working with the governor and a member of the assembly to try to get done in the business, uh, many of the business groups. And what, what, what it does is three things. Um, when we pass a law, we give, we give the ability for different agencies to promulgate rules on how that, that law goes into existence. For example, the DNR <laughs> promulgates a lot of rules over hunting and you know, fishing and things like that. And um, oftentimes these agencies start to overstep their bounds a little bit and start doing things that, that go a little bit beyond that scope. So what this bill does is it adds a public hearing up front in the process. So it gives chance for public input. And then if the, the main thrust of this is if there's a rule that an agency is, is implementing that has more than a $10 million impact on businesses or local levels of government, we as legislators actually have to pass a law to approve that. So that way an agency isn't going rogue and passing rules that puts this huge fiscal impact on, on either business or, or local levels of government. And, um, and the other important provision of this bill is that it, um, the, the agency in the current system is, is supposed to put out a fiscal analysis of what the rule is going to cost. And if we as legislators don't think that that fiscal analysis is accurate, we can request an independent analysis of that to make sure that 
that the agency isn't being selective with, with what the cost of the rule could be. So we've been working really hard um, to get that done. Uh, just a couple examples of you know, instances I've worked with with businesses in my district. Uh, when, when I had one of my first hearing sessions back in uh, spring of last year, um, there was a small business owner up in Manitowoc that came, and she owns, uh, it was a new business that's been moving into the state of Wisconsin, and they have flotation devices, which does massage and sensory um, therapy. It's a new business, and the state, through one of the agencies, was trying to regulate her as a commercial pool. <laughs> and it's obviously not a pool. It's a, it's a little, I went and visited her business, it's like a little small coffin, and they fill it up with water and Epsom salt, and it's, it's not my thing, but uh, apparently some people like it. And, uh, it's, it's helpful to some people. And I guess they like sit in there for hours, and um, fascinating business, but, but the state was really coming down on her, trying to make her make all these changes to comply with commercial pools, which was going to put her out of business. So we, and granted, the, the bill that I'm working on won't help her because it doesn't have a $10 million advantage or a $10 million cost. But th these are just some of the things that, that sometimes state bureaucrats do to local businesses, which can be very costly and make it, make it hard for them to operate. So we, uh, the representative up there, Representative Piddle, and I worked really hard to and put a lot of pressure on that agency to change the law and add a new, new rule that that um, oversees how these businesses operate. Now there's eight new businesses across the state that are similar to this, so so it's a good thing. Another another example more locally here in Sheboygan is um, we still have a few commercial fishermen operating out of Sheboygan. Uh, some very interesting gentlemen, if you ever meet guys who spend most of their life on Lake Michigan. They're very interesting, and. Um, they do a lot of their chub fishing, and, and the DNR makes rules about the quotas of how many they can catch and things like that. And um, the uh, the DNR had imposed a new rule to essentially would put them out of business if, if the rule went into effect. And we had a committee hearing yesterday where the DNR didn't even show up to the committee hearing, which I was very frustrated um, because we've been going back and forth with them for quite a while. And um, but we I had four commercial fishermen from Sheboygan show up in Manitowoc, or in Manitowoc in Madison for the hearing, and uh, we suspended the rule that the DNR was trying to put in place. So we have some time to work with the commercial fishermen and the DNR to make sure that that this industry that just just doesn't affect these uh, couple commercial fishermen, but it also is producing fish for Schwartz Fish Market and things like that, which. You know, helps to the local flavor of Sheboygan. So, so we're working with the DNR and these guys to make sure we can find a law that, or a rule going forward that can help these guys stay in business and be viable for the future. So, I was happy to make sure that we got that done for a local business. So, since you guys are all involved in business, if there's there's anything like that that I can work on for you, I mean, that's that's a lot of what we're we're doing in Madison is making sure that that governments making it easier for you guys to survive and be competitive and not have to deal with with bureaucracy and you can do what you do best and provide your services to the community. So I will turn it over to Terry. I'm going to stay sitting if that's okay, Devin. Uh, thank you all for being here. It's really an honor and a privilege. Uh, Betsy, congratulations on the gala that the Chamber hosted last week. I thought uh, that was wonderful. How about Stephanie Klett for an MC? She was uh, she was very entertaining. So that's good. That's good. Uh, the I think what 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 I want to talk about is some of the accomplishments um, of of uh, the legislature this past year, and I can assure you that our discussion today will be much more civil than what we're seeing like last night and what we're seeing on the national level. You know, there's there's clearly frustration and dissatisfaction with, with the politicians. Uh, of course, at the national level, we have increasing deficit spending. However, on the state, uh, things went very well. Uh, we have a balanced budget that was passed, a $74 billion biannual uh, budget uh, that included no tax increases. 
Uh, other accomplishments for the year was uh, to, to uh, change prevailing wage, right to work, uh, GAB reform, John Doe reform. Uh, one of the interesting bills that I that uh, also came out was the budgeting process and. The way it works is the agencies uh, work with the governor to, to propose a budget. And they're always, they maybe have a wish list up here, and then, then you have the legislature that tries to deal with this budget that, of course, doesn't have the knowledge and the inside approach that, that the, the bureaucrats uh, do. So uh, there was the bill to not only pass a proposed budget, but a flat budget and a 5% reduction in the budget. And I think, again, that's, that's a, a, a quality bill. Um, a couple of the, the committees that, that, that I serve on, um, uh, for those of you who, who don't know me, my prior career was in banking, 30 some years at Oostburg State Bank. Uh, as far as my district, uh, you're all in Devon's district, in the Senate district, but in the assembly district that, that I'm privileged to serve, the 26th district, and the southern boundary is the Sheboygan Ozaki County line. So that would include the township of Holland, which is Cedar Grove, town of Sherman, Random Lake, town of Lima, town of Wilson, and about three quarters of the city of Sheboygan and the city of Sheboygan Falls. Uh, I'm privileged to, to serve as vice chairman of the Financial Institutions Committee, served on the Consumer Protection Committee, the uh, Ways and Means Committee, uh, Housing and Real Estate, and the Workforce Development Committee. Uh, I was also privileged to serve on the Speaker's Task Force of Alzheimer's and Dementia. Well, we had uh, numerous uh, four or five uh, public hearings. We, we had some tours. Uh, it was a bipartisan effort. We came out with 10 bills uh, that related to Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, it's a big deal, it's a big issue, as I'm sure all of you can, can point to a family member uh, that has been affected by that. There's no cure, uh, but the, the purpose of the bills was to uh, bring awareness, to provide some funding for research, to provide some uh, funding for respite, uh, and uh, so that was, uh, that was a good thing. Um, again, I want to remind everybody that 94% of the bills that we pass are, are bipartisan. And uh, you wouldn't think that by reading the uh, Journal Sentinel. Of course, they want to focus on, on controversy and focus on where there's disagreement. But in general, there is a lot of agreement that's going on um, at the state. So. Have we answered that first question there, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, one thing I should I neglected to say beforehand is both of our our guests have stated that any questions you have during the presentation, feel free. Before we go on, uh, you, you talked about some bills that, that you were working on, um, and a total of uh, 15 bills I think that you had hoped to pass. Uh, I've had four bills that so far have been signed by the governor. I have four more bills that are awaiting the Senate uh, uh, hearing or the Senate session, which will be March 15. So I'm, I'm hopeful to have eight bills passed um, that I'm very proud of uh, um, in this first session that I had. Uh, of, of a major bill, or the biggest um, uh, concern, I think, is a bill dealing with foreclosure reform. And uh, what that means is the the uh, redemption period, the length of time that it takes when a property is in foreclosure. And because of federal regulations, that time has extended. So the, the purpose of the bill was to shorten up that time so that properties could be on the market quicker and so that it wouldn't drag down the property values of the community and of the neighborhoods that they, that they serve. So I worked very closely with, with some Democratic interests uh, in Milwaukee that are very, very concerned about abandoned properties. It's a, it's a bit of a problem in Sheboygan, Chad, I'm, I'm assuming, but it certainly is not like it is in Milwaukee. Uh, so, so it was quite interesting uh, working through that process. We worked with a number of trade groups, and uh, it was interesting that the, the, the press uh, from from Milwaukee focused, of course, on where the, where the mayor and, and I disagreed on, on the abandonment portion, but they failed to report that they really did like 90% of the bill 
that did shorten it up. So uh, like, and it's a good example of, of the media. You, you, uh, there's always two sides, obviously. So, that work? Thank you. Next, <coughs> pardon me. Next question is: How has your first term status impacted, or has it impacted, what you feel you can get done in Madison? Well, you know, coming from private industry, uh, my my concern was. In government, things are going to take a long time, and when in private industry, especially where, where I was uh, serving, I you snap your fingers and, and things get done. And uh, but it doesn't work that way in government. Uh, a couple of the bills that I worked on, um, the the, the uh, constituents that brought those bills said, "Yeah, I've been working on this for four years, and we finally get it done." Uh, on the other hand, I, I was very impressed with the with the organization and the efficiency uh, that that our Republican Assembly Caucus uh, works on. That was pretty surprising to me. Um, so that was one one thing. Yeah, I think my biggest frustration over my first year, and I sort of touched on this, or first year and a half, I sort of touched on this in my last. Answer on one of the bills I'm working on is, is dealing with government bureaucracy. It's not dealing with my fellow legislators. It's dealing with the different agencies, and you know sometimes there's been um, employees in some of these agencies that have been doing things the same way for 30, 35 years, and to try get them to change and get you answers and work with you, you would think would sometimes be easier since we have both houses that are run by Republicans and a governor who appoints the heads of these uh, agencies who's also a Republican, but it's that's not always the case, so it's been a little bit frustrating from time to time. But no, I think I think we've, uh, I think we do get to make a difference. Um, I think that's sort of your question. Can, can, can we make a difference? Um, I'll give you uh, maybe one example. Um, there was a change to, since we have a couple of educators in the room, change to May 2 course options. Um, that, that program a couple of years ago by, by the governor in a budget that said that schools cannot charge parents to get these, these programs anymore. And uh, just to let you know, my father failed in getting this changed. But, uh, but I came in and <laughs> no one told him I said that. <laughs> but I came in and through the budget process uh, worked uh, worked with the members on the finance committee and got that changed so the schools could once again charge the parents uh, the money to get these college credits at a very reduced rate and make sure that this program is is uh, sustainable going into the future. So I was I was happy to get that done. And you know just some of the you know the things I referenced on working for the credit we're not finished yet working for the commercial fishermen since we don't have a solution yet, but just stopping the rule, um, helping out the business up in Manitowoc, you know, those are some things that you can get done to uh, to help local businesses. So I, I think, and you know, we've been, I think Terry and I have worked on a couple bills together, um, some real high profile ones, but uh, <laughs> I guess, uh, Mark, I, I too wanted to, I'll say, correct your statement on we're here from Madison. That couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, I, I spend one or two days in Madison, and the rest of the days are in the district. We have a regular monthly meetings with the school superintendents. We have, that is very well attended. We appreciate the dialogue and the discussion we have with that. We have regular monthly meetings with the Sheboygan County Board and the department heads. And again, that is well attended. We have bi-monthly meetings with the city of Sheboygan and their uh, board uh, members and their and their department heads. Uh, we meet with, with the chamber uh, quarterly or, or every other month. So uh, I don't want to spend any more time in Madison than what we have to. And, and so we, we really want to reach out and learn what's going on in the district. And of course, this is one way to learn that as well. Suggested not actually use the microphone. So, point taken, Terry. Uh, obviously, a hot topic here, as you know. Can either of you or both of you provide an update on transportation, funding in general, and Highway 23 in particular, please? If I had a nickel for every time I was asked about Highway 23, I have a well funded campaign for my next re election run. But, uh, you know, Highway 23, um, to, to give a little bit of the backstory, if you haven't been following you closely, which is probably not the case for anybody in this room, but uh, 
it was set to go in 2015 to start work on the project. They actually had up all the barrels along 23, the weekend before uh, Memorial Day. And uh, then on that Friday afternoon, a federal judge put a stop to it, saying that he had some questions in the, the traffic projections that were done 10, 15 years ago, and saying that those projections weren't actually correct, and asked for updated information uh, from the DOT to make sure that the project is justified. Um, personally, I don't think that we should necessarily have to justify road projects with traffic counts because we're the legislators, uh, but uh, we should be held accountable to you, whether it's, 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 it's accountable what we're doing in road projects. But uh, anyways, the, uh, the DOT then went and, and redid the traffic uh, counts, and they found out that they were a little lower than projected, but they still justified a four-lane highway. They looked at other options, such as passing lanes, uh, things like that. They said with the traffic flow and the accidents and everything that a four-lane highway is justified. Um, so they gave that report back, and they worked with the federal, since there's federal money involved, they had to work with the federal government in this project. Um, they put, so they gave that report back to the judge um, in December, and the judge has yet to make his final decisions. So we're hoping that it's, it's too late to get anything done this year anymore since all the all the projects are being uh, let out here pretty soon for building projects for 2016. It's still in the budget for 2017, so we're hoping that that the uh, that the judge can make a favorable decision and it can go forward in 2017. Um, in transportation funding in general, um, since I'm talking about Highway 23, I'll tell you that what I think is the, the major problem with transportation, which we need to ultimately find an answer to, which I don't know what it is yet, but uh, in, the, in the budget we put in uh, money to audit uh, the DOT to see how they're spending their money. If you look at the Highway 23 project, when it was first put into the budget back in 1999, so that shows you how long we've been talking about this, it's put in, into the state budget back in 1999, it was a $42 million project. Today, it's a $145 million project. It's a 350% increase in 16 years. That's 18% a year increase. So, you know, a lot of people say that our problem is, is a revenue problem. We don't have enough money coming in with gas taxes because cars are becoming more fuel efficient, things like that, which is partially true. But our gas tax revenue actually does go up every year. It's averaged about 0.8% over the last 15 years uh, increase, which obviously isn't keeping up with inflation, but it still is increasing. But when you have the expense side increasing by 18% and the revenue side increasing by 0.8%, you can, you can sort of see the, the challenge. Where we can't just raise taxes to fix this problem. In the initial part of the budget, the governor proposed borrowing $1.3 billion for transportation. If we would have done that with a gas tax, to cover that just with an increase in gas tax, that would be 17 cents on a gallon. Can you imagine if, if me and Terry were running on re-election campaigns, we fixed the transportation funding problem by raising your gas taxes by 17 cents a gallon? Wow. <laughs> so that's, that's, I mean, it's, it's, that's unsustainable, uh, the, the increasing expense costs. So we need to make sure that we're we're prioritizing transportation projects and trying to make sure they're they're more efficient. Uh, part of the way we did that was was um, exempting local projects from prevailing wage, which will is projected to save 10, 11 percent on on local projects. So um, that that is my spiel on. By the way, we ended up borrowing 850 million in the budget, which is the lowest amount of borrowing in the last 20 years. So I was, we're we're trending in the right direction, but we still have a uh, looming problem of transportation down the road. Hi, Tom. On uh, <clears throat> Highway 23 is after you and I drive this a couple of times a week now, where we uh, can understand what's going on. And this was a, a federal judge, and you say, well, what, what does this have to do with Highway 23? Well, there were about 25% about of the money that's involved is federal money. So that's how the federal judge uh, came into play here. And um, this, this, with this lawsuit by the environmental group, um, the judge has to, has to find standing. The term is standing. Those of us in Wisconsin, we can't complain about something in California because you may not have standing in California. 
So the, stand, the, the judge found that there is one person, or maybe two persons, that were members of this environmental group that live on Highway 23, and therefore there was standing for this lawsuit to be brought forth. So it's just a great example of, of, of the problem with separation of powers. You know, we have we have a, a three branch system that, that we have the judicial, the legislative, and the executive, and uh, we feel as legislators that. Again, we're accountable to you, the taxpayers, and, and if, if, if we feel that projects or is, is worthy of, of an expenditure, that shouldn't be up to the judge. But that's the system that we live in right now. Would you like us to take questions, Mark? Yeah. A federal judge, uh, is that person appointed, I think, right? Well, um, correct me. Uh, yeah, they're appointed, and then it's is it a, like a life appointment? And are they? They're not subject to election like the Supreme Court justices are, uh, and, or circuit judges are subject to election. I think this is a, a, a appointment. Just wondering. That. Yeah, and, and just general comments on transportation. Yeah, you're right. That's that's the one thing we didn't solve, uh, and. And as, as Republicans, it's very difficult for us to raise taxes, or philosophically. And, and if we would take a poll of you out here, and you'd say, well, would you be in favor of a, of a nickel? Would you be in favor of, of six cents uh, increase in your gas tax? And we might find some of you in favor of that. That's a very efficient way to, to raise revenue. Uh, as opposed to setting up toll booths or setting up uh, reporting what your mileage is. And I know that was based on mileage and not on gas, but that invades privacy, so that has some problems with that. And as, as Devin well stated, we want to make sure that, that we can have the projects run efficiently before we just raise revenue uh, as, as a solution for that. Yeah. Just curious, what drives an 18% per year increase in the, in the cost of building Highway 23? Um, I, I heard one answer here that said union contracts, uh, uh, cost of material, asphalt, uh, concrete. Um, I, I don't have a good answer for you. No. Thank you. Another question that's very much in the forefront here in Sheboygan County is the ozone non-attainment zone and the monitoring station at Highway 42. We've worked very closely as a business advocacy committee with the DNR, EPA, and Central Leaven in the past on efforts to prove that the data collected from the Kohler Andre uh, monitoring site is not accurate and it doesn't really measure what's going on in Sheboygan County, but rather it measures what's going on in communities along the lake shore, further south, Chicago, Gary, Indiana, and so on. If we needed funding to sustain our monitoring station outside of Coal Rondry Park, would we have your support in pursuing this effort in trying to move into an attainment status in our county? Yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. And I, I, haven't, I haven't heard much uh, on this issue other than I I'm aware that we moved the station, uh, but as far as anything beyond that, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know if you know any more about the issue, but yeah, I don't know if it's on the forefront, like you said, since I haven't been asked about this in a year and a half. But uh, yeah, it, I mean, it's I think it is important to uh, get that new site set up because the the one by Caller Andrew is just measuring all the pollution coming up from Gary, Indiana, Chicago, all the all the fun places down south. Well, on a related matter, <clears throat> um, there are citizens in the town of Wilson that are quite concerned about the probable deterioration of their individual residential wells should the Kohler golf course go ahead. And I just wondered, we're talking hundreds of wells that would be, you know, think of Flint, Michigan, only different causes. Um, so where do you, both of you, stand on that proposed golf course? Um, I think it's actually 10 wells is what the 
the proposal is, not hundreds of wells. Um, no, I'm talking about the wells that would be affected. Oh. Um, the, the DNR is studying uh, the impact of that right now. Um, they have scientists and we'll wait to see what their what their um, report says and their recommendation is on those high capacity wells. I mean, that's the same way where every other, you know, CAPO or anybody else who wants to drill a, a high capacity well has to go through that DNR permitting process. Overall, I, I support the, the Kohler Golf Course. I think it'd be great for the community. Uh, we're, we already get major um, international spotlight with, with uh, Whistling Straits, and it brings all kinds of, of people into the area. So I think it's, I think it'd be fantastic. Mean, we're already known as one of the top 10 uh, golf destinations in, in the world. So I, I think adding a, when, when the Kohler Company builds a golf course, they do it right. And uh, so I think it'd be fantastic for, for the community. Again, it's, it's, a, it's a local issue as far as zoning. Um, you, we, we don't have uh, state legislators making, making those, those decisions. Um, so saying all that, however, Kohler has demonstrated that they are a first class hospitality organization and, and um, investments and initiatives that they've done have been done thoughtfully and have been done first class. Are there any efforts at the state level with regards to the ever-growing heroin issue within our communities? Yes, uh, there was, it's called the HOPE Agenda, Heroin, Opiates, and I can't remember what the other acronym stands for. Maybe somebody else can help me out here. Uh, spearheaded by, by uh, Representative John Nygren, uh, and th that's been, uh, there are quite a number of bills that were, that were done to try to uh, um, police that situation and improve that situation and address that situation. Yeah, he, to give a little more background, he had a, a daughter who, who overdosed on, on heroin and uh, so he's been working really hard over the last two sessions actually to keep making changes to law to uh, to help the situation. Uh, I think we've been moving a little more to helping out local uh, counties with drug courts, trying to find alternatives to just incarceration for for people who uh, to help help them get the treatment because if they don't get any treatment, um, it also ties in somewhat with the the mental health aspects too because a lot of these people are suffering from mental health so so we need to it's it's obviously a, a big challenge in, in Sheboygan and Manitowoc County where I represent and uh, so we've taken some steps I think there's a long ways we need to go yet but uh, we're moving in the right direction Are there discussions or efforts being put forward reevaluating the mismatch in funding of our schools to help in closing the skilled labor shortage, especially what we're seeing here in Chihuahua County? I don't know if I necessarily agree with the premise of this question, but uh, <laughs> um, in, in the budget that was passed last year, um, there's a $100 increase per, per student going for education next year. Uh, the governor in his state of the um, state address back in January said that during our next budget cycle there's going to be an emphasis on, on working on school funding. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens next session with that. But uh, you know, overall I think um, that, that there, is, there is an issue that, that needs to be done. But, um, We've been working with our, our local superintendents on and off throughout this entire process. I guess the other thing I'd, I'd like to add is that um, when we started the budget process, um, we had about, in a $70 billion budget, there was a, about an extra $3, million or $3 billion that wasn't accounted for when we started the budget process. 800,000 of that was just going to to increases in Medicaid expenses, state Medicaid expenses, just to maintain current levels of funding. So um, we've, we've seen the economy pick up a little bit, so hopefully that, that bodes well for the future. But uh, I think we're both committed to 
education and making sure that we can have quality teachers and, and quality schools in the community. Could we have a show of hands here from companies? Uh, are, are you looking for empl employees right now? Show of hands. And you're not able to find employees. And so there's been an increased emphasis on tech schools and sense of technical education, and I certainly support that. I appreciate uh, some of the partnerships that's being done by, by uh, LTC, by Lakeland College. Um, those, those are good things rather than having um, some of the sharing of credits being mandated by, by state government. They're reaching um, agreements on their own, and I admit that's a good thing. Yeah, if, you, if, you, if you've seen the presentation by the Sheboygan County Economic Development Corporation, we actually have more jobs, or we're close to the tipping point where we have more more job openings and people available to work in this community. It's, it's, it's a challenge that that the Economic Development Corporation is, is looking at facing, with partnering with the Chamber, and, um, and as, as Terry mentioned, I think our local schools have done a good job with uh, sort of emphasizing that there's great careers in, in Sheboygan County manufacturing and partnering with LTC and the groups like that. And um, you know it's it's gonna be it's gonna be tough with sort of the aging population, especially in the northern part of my district in Manitowoc County, as the baby boomers keep retiring. Um, and my generation not producing enough future workers to fill that to fill that gap, um, it's it's gonna be Going to be a challenge. In, too much. Well, <laughs> it's going to be going to be a, going to be a challenge to uh, meet the ever increasing demands in, in, in all industries. Uh, that's what we've been hearing across sectors. I think you both might have touched on this last question a little bit, so I'll, I'll expand it. I'll take my prerogative to do that. <laughs> Based on your professional careers, what has been the most surprising lesson <laughs> you've learned since taking office? And what I would add to that is. Maybe, being as this is the last question, any closing thoughts that you'd like to leave us with, please? Well, <clears throat> it's been really interesting being a member of the legislature as in coming in as I consider myself a citizen legislator, having spent a career prior to that and bringing a lot of life experiences to the legislature. The legislature, the 99, or the, in the assembly, the 99, Folks that represent the each and every corner of the state come from so many different uh, different ages and different backgrounds and 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 bring various levels of expertise and, and industry specialties that, that they come from and having that that group work together and try to reach compromises that's been been very interesting and, and very informative and, and you know that's the beauty of of having bringing government and having people um, come with, with those kinds of perspectives. Um, that, that's been, been uh, really rewarding for me. I think for me, there, there wasn't a whole lot of surprises since I was sort of a political junkie ahead of time and had a little knowledge of, of what happened at the state level through relatives. But uh, so a lot of it did take me by surprise, even though I saw it was different when you're actually living it and being in those circumstances. But I think, I mean, I've, I've just found great enjoyment. Um, the, the stuff that goes on in Madison didn't surprise me as much as how really interesting the job is when you're out in the district, you know, meeting with superintendents, touring businesses. We have so many fascinating businesses I do all around the, uh, the district when I get to go from touring, you know, Acuity to Johnsonville to uh, there's a great old um, manufacturer up in Manitowoc, Scanna, that's probably the most fascinating um, factory that I've toured in a while. It's in AmeriCollect, um, Viking Mesa down in Oostburg. You get to meet all these different business leaders, get to go to community groups like this, uh, business groups. Um, did an Eagle Skull presentation last week, Sunday, so for to me, the most enjoyable part of of this job, it's not the parades because I'm a parade every stinking weekend in the summer from Father's Day until two weeks after Labor Day. So it's not the parades. <laughs> that gets a little old after a while, but but just going to different events, meeting meeting different people. Uh, 
you're learning something new every day, finding out what's what's going on in the community, what means, what's what's important, what's on people's minds. So that's that's I don't know if you call that a surprise, but for me that's been the the most exciting and enjoyable part of of this job over the the last year and a half. <laughs> Any closing thoughts? That was a pretty good <laughs> <laughs> I just want you to understand that certainly I and, and, and Devin as well, we're, we, we want to hear from you. Uh, we want to know what's on your mind. Um, uh, we we want to be, be accessible, and I, I think we, we do that. Uh, so um, we, we, we hope that you sense that as well. Uh, we again, there's so many different industries that we need to know about and that we don't know about. So we don't. How do we know this unless somebody tells us and, and informs us? So please uh, uh, feel that you are comfortable talking with your your state legislators. And uh, again, thank you all for being here. Hey, Terry, Devin, thank you very much for coming to speak with us. I, I appreciate how very unselfish you are with your time coming to speak with us many, many times. I also appreciate how thoughtful you both are and your comments. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to make a couple of announcements about upcoming chamber events that you may be interested in and we'd love to have you join us for. We have a focal point on Wednesday, March 16th, entitled Crucial Conversations. It should be very, very worthwhile. Our next First Friday Forum will be April 1st, April Fool's Day. Chad Palaszczuk will be updating us on the city's developments, and I'm sure there will be no joking along there. Uh, another event that's coming up that I think will be fascinating, Business After Hours, the Sheboygan Symphony Orchestra at the Wheel Center for the Performing Arts, Tuesday, March 8th, 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. So your Chamber of Commerce is continuing to work to put together a very interesting program for you. And that's it. I thought you maybe had more questions. Because I have one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. We should. Betsy just made a point that I should ask. It. Are there any more questions out there other than what we already asked? And it was a selfish question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just, you know, as we all know, we're trying to attract and retain people to our area. We need to grow. And one of the factors in that is having a really vibrant community. And one of the factors in that is the arts which I think we're particularly strong in, in Sheboygan County. Um, there are a couple bills right now. There's a Senate Bill 483, and there's a, an Assembly Bill 636. And I think they've been moving both. I think they're out of committee. They're out of joint finance, I think. Um, <laughs> you're looking it up. I think a few of the committees you mentioned you're on, um, you know, joint finance that was approved. So it's called the Creative Economy Development Initiative. Um, it's a modest amount of money, but it is for matching grants for uh, creative businesses, um, small businesses, most of them, but also just to support that in general in communities. So just curious where that is and... What was the uh, bill number? For you, it's 483. I'm it's available for scheduling in the Senate. Yeah. It, 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 did, did we pass okay. it in the Assembly? You passed it, yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. great. So, so the Assembly passed it. it. It's available for scheduling in the Senate, so we, it might be in the calendar for that. I actually looked at the calendar, but I was not looking for that building okay, in particular right. on what we might be voting on. Yeah, just, you know. Quality staff is very, very important. Yeah. <laughs> so. Appreciation Day today. It is. It is. <laughs> I, I really appreciate the, of Senator Lemieux and his staff that that work with my office a lot, and we work very closely together. And uh, uh, but yeah, my wife and I enjoyed the, uh, um, the the groups that were down on the in the central part of Sheboygan uh, by the Color Arts Center uh, a couple of times this summer. Another question? Yes, Dave. Um, Last session, there was a big reduction in funding for the UW system. Has the legislature spent any time looking at how that reduction was implemented throughout the system? Uh, have you just basically said, your problem, you do it, and let them do it? 
Well, you, you call it a big reduction. Uh, uh, Percentage-wise, I don't know that it was a big reduction. Uh, there was a, a, several sessions ago where the legislature um, suggested or required that that the uh, UW system spend down some of its some of its uh, reserves. Uh, so, rather than us micromanaging the process, no, it was left up to to the, the colleges and universities to to uh, incorporate that. It was, I mean, the, there's been reductions for about the last six budgets, actually, to the UW system, and yet their reserves keep growing. We put tuition freezes on and their reserves keep growing. Um, so I think, uh, but, but the main concern for me is, is the two-year colleges, um, because there were some cuts to them in the last budget. Um, some of that was restored through the legislative process, but uh, they've, it's forced them to maybe make some good changes at the, at the two-year colleges. They now, instead of having a um, <coughs> chancellor or whatever you call the person that runs a college <coughs> campus, a dean, thank you. <laughs> but instead of having a dean at each of these two-year colleges, they've gone with regional deans, um, things like transitioning to that. So I think, I think it's sometimes good to, uh, to challenge agencies to find some cost savings. Yes, Tom. challenge your comment that it's contentious. I, 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 I would disagree with that. I think, I think it's, 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 uh, we, we grow a lot from it. And uh, thank you for those comments, Tom. Charles. I saw a headline about some kind of uh, changes being made to the workman's compensation system in Wisconsin. Is that going to finally be brought up to the 21st century because it's so old and antiquated, it's really not working for my company? Uh, are you talking about uh, there's been proposals for a fee schedule? Uh, there's arguments with the medical folks uh, on that. Is, are you talking about yeah, no, workers' comp or unemployment? Or? Yeah, no, not unemployment. Workers' compensation for injury on the job. Okay. And you know, I can put it with the carpentry uh, system. Yeah. Uh, the carpentry system is sector just because I build piers. And I have so little to do with carpentry that it, it doesn't make any sense. We're not elevated. We don't use power tools. You know, and it's like I'm, I'm way in the wrong thing, and it's just, it's just, you know, it doesn't make any sense. And it obviously was written, what, 110 years ago. You would like more categories of, of well, classifications? And some reflection that I'm a good employer with a safe working conditions, and we only had two claims in 30 years, and only one had stitches. So, but I don't get any credit for that. And I have to pay 15%, $15 for every $100 and pay to my guys. You have to go into the system for the bad guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. uh, I'm not aware of any bills that specifically address that situation. I don't know if you do. Let's, let's work on that. Because, right. you know, they just randomly put businesses based on the nature of your work in certain categories. And there's only about, I don't know, 80 categories. But to what extent is it experience based? Not at all. Nothing. Not at all. Looks like a good project for me to work on. All right. Let's get together on that. <laughs>